John McAnulty will now present his thesis. Right. Uh, I think I may have been uh, invented here under misapprehension. Because uh, although in the early Sierra era, there were several people who were members of the Fourth International, uh, and although I'm a member of the Fourth International, we weren't members of the Fourth International at the same time. Uh, and there's a story behind that which I will give uh, in short form in a moment or two. Uh, but what there was, was three components which were common in Belfast and Dublin and elsewhere. And those three components were the resurgence of the working class. After a long period of getting beaten down, down the working class in Ireland, and lots of other places, started to stand on their own. the mic could change a bit. I can barely hear you, John. Sure. So we share a bit more? Okay. Yeah. Right. Right. That's right. Right. Oh, bring the mic down. Uh, I stand. Is that better? Is that it? That's both Okay. Right. So, number one, at that time, there was a resurgence of the working class. People had been beaten down in the previous generation suddenly wanted to stand on their hind legs. Number two, uh, there were uh, the remnants of earlier struggles. People who'd been through the mill and had essentially been defeated, but they'd something to say. And thirdly, there were young people. Young people who weren't prepared to live with the shit that was put on top of them and wanted to know how to defeat it. And those were people like Peter Graham, like Neil Dalton, like Martin Keegan. So, the resurgence in Dublin, the Dedis era, was a resurgence of the Republican left, and it was also a resurgence in the International Socialist Movement, the Fourth International. Um, and within this, the Republican movement, there has been this difficulty, and there remains this difficulty, of how do you marry radical politics to physical force? How do you do that? Uh, and the Fourth International at that time was just in the process of making a big turn, and the turn was called guerrillaism. It meant uniting with groups in Latin America who endorsed uh, the theories of Che Guevara, the Foucault theories, uh, which were brought to Europe by a guy called Register Bray. So the idea was an armed group, political program, seize territory, hold it, and start to gather support in the Northern class. Um, and two things happened. One was the Sierra Era group was defeated and disbanded. And the Trotskyist movement in Dublin became the movement for a socialist republic. Now, the next bit's a wee bit complicated. Um, I, joined, I got into politics uh, in, uh, in a movement called the Young Socialist Alliance in Belfast. And the Young Socialist Alliance was founded by emigrants, people who'd been in the left in England, but had come back to Ireland. And that was Michael Farrell, um, just going to uh, my famous Eamon. Eamon. Uh, Eamon uh, and uh, Cyril Tillman and Yuri, and there were a couple of other people. But, uh, so they came back, but they themselves had been drawn back and organised around the Irish question by the remnants of the Irish workers group. So there was that continuity in the Irish class struggle which nearly died away to nothing. You know, the people who remembered being in a, a socialist movement had shrunk down to three or four people, but they were able to reinvigorate a movement in Belfast that grew, grew quite quickly. It grew to about 20 people who were in the Young Socialist Alliance, and then when Pope Peeps Moxie was founded, we were essentially the only people in it who had any coherent political ideas. Uh, and then there was a big struggle actually because uh, the PD was like the, the GPO, everybody was in it. 
Um, so the big struggle with people who were going to become members of the SDLP. And there was a battle essentially between anarchism and Marxism, uh, with John McGuffin leading the anarchists uh, out into the hills. Um, so uh, the, po the point I want to make here is that the uh, movement in Belfast uh, looked at physical force as a defence question. Uh, and there were two phases to that. One was the, the pogrom of 68, when people had to organise themselves very quickly. Uh, and that led to the movement of sort of amorphous defence organisation. And then later on, we felt the need for a more formal structure and uh, we set up the Irish Citizen Army. Uh, now, we thought, well, how do Marxists deal with this question? And the formula we came up with was the party rules the army. That's the formula. That will solve all these problems that come up in physical force movement. The party must rule, and that will solve everything. And looking back, I would say I was wrong about that. Um, because it's a difficult question and it's not solved in that way. Right? Um, it's a help, it's an absolutely essential first step. Uh, in fact, we went to uh, early meetings with Seamus Costello and we said, well, you're going to set up a new movement, who's going to rule? And essentially, Seamus says, the army. And we had nothing for her to do. Uh, so it's a first step to say, if you're going to set up a political movement, and there's a question of force involved. Uh, the party has to come first. The, the political program for organising working class is Parliament. Uh, and the provost came up with an R formula, and it's a formula of the cutting edge. And uh, uh, what I would say is that's a completely wrong formula. The armed forces aren't the cutting edge, the working class is the cutting edge. And you got all sorts of nonsense where we'd organise uh, enormous numbers of people to go onto the streets of Belfast and we were told to get off the streets because the boys were coming through. And it's just endless nonsense like that. It's a very, very complex question to deal with uh, uh, physical force. Um, I think the other thing I want to say is that one, one of the things that people will not get looking at a distance uh, on the civil rights movement, the evolution that proves the, the growth of a, a movement for national independence and so on, is the level of class struggle inside. Uh, so the civil rights movement, when it was set up, uh, involved labor rights, uh, the proto-SDLP, uh, and the Communist Party, and it was essentially seen as a way of lobbying Westminster. That's what it was for. It was there to end the Westminster rule, where nobody could discuss anything went, that went on in the north of Ireland, no, no matter how many much buckets of blood were spilt, it couldn't be raised in Westminster. That was the civil rights movement's main aim. And when it very, very suddenly became a movement of the masses, uh, there was a big struggle uh, on the part of the reformists and the bourgeois to push everybody back off the streets again. And probably the key point in that was the, uh, the O'Neill truce. O'Neill says, if you give me a bit of time, I come up with reforms as long as you don't annoy the loyalists. Uh, thank you. Forty years later, <laughs> if you breathe too hard, you're not know, you know But uh, and uh, John Hume and the mass of the civil rights leadership said, "That's great. We'll call off all demonstrations." And it was against that background that we organised the Burnt Harvard March. And uh, you know when they when the B specials uh, got stuck into this. You know, the vast majority of the nationalist work class says, well, well, what's this about a truce? You know, what's this about uh, reforms coming someday? You know, we're not buying that anymore. Um, I think 
the mistake of the 68 movement in general across the world, across Europe, and the mistake that we made in the North was that we tried to go around the traditional leadership of the working class. Uh, so, for example, one of the lesser known footnotes of history is that in 1968, the Irish Trade Union movement was organised, was recognised in the North, 1969, I think it was. Before that, there was no recognition for trade unions. It couldn't be represented to the government, to any physical bodies, and most employers wouldn't negotiate with them. Uh, and that was because they were an all-Ireland movement. But the settlement that was made was to set up a movement called Nick Ectu. And today, you cannot get anyone who's in a leading position in the trade union movement in the north or in the south to talk about ICTU, to talk about the Irish Council of Trade Unions. The movement has been partitionized to a very, very large extent. And even where it hasn't been partitionized, there is absolutely no intention of, state, of opposing the status quo either north or south. Right, so I'd like to finish off. Um, there are three questions, I think, that come out of this. Um, one is the ro role of physical force. Uh, the second is uh, the basis for united action, especially united action between the public and the socialists. And the third is, uh, how do we recreate the atmosphere, the movement of 68 today? How do we move from being on the offensive, or being on the defensive, to being, move to being on the, the offensive? Now, I'm, go I'm going to stop there and leave that fairly open, because it's up to people in the room to say which direction we'd like that discussion to go in. But, I mean, I think the most important question is, how do we revive the struggle? And I'd like to make three points to finish with. Number one, that's up to the working class. One of the big weaknesses of uh, some of the socialist movements and the Republican movements are they substitute for the class. The class aren't doing it, we do it instead. We should never do it instead. We should put the case to the working class, but the working class have to act on their own behalf. And at the moment, they don't appear to be yet ready. And the reason they're not yet ready is they're clinging on like grim death to the leadership they had in the past and they won't let go of it. Uh, the second issue is uh, how do we create an alternative programme? Because one of the things about 68 was there were philosophers, writers, leftists galore writing tome after tome about a critique of capital. And today, if you go to the socialist movement and pick up the stuff they're handing out, it's filled with despair. It talks about a better, fair way to pay all this money, a better, fair way to accept what capitalism's handing out, and the idea of revolt is totally absent. Now, the idea of revolt is not just a matter of shouting. It's a matter of saying, here's what before us, here's how we analyze it, here's what the, the, the thinkers of the past have told us, and here's us popularizing it in meetings like this, in publications, and going around the country, and trying to build the nucleus of a movement that, that has the confidence to raise up. Uh, and the third thing we need, and I've sort of said it already, is, well, we need young people to do that, you know. I'm on the Hopalog and my Zimmer frame, but young people need to have the confidence uh, to see that the fact that the leadership that they had before has let them down does not mean that the struggle will let them down.